Would you please turn in your Bible to the book of 2 Peter? The book of 2 Peter. Hey, as it was said in the announcements, we have a baptism today. God has been doing some incredible things in our church. By my estimation, I think uh, about four people have been saved in the last three months at Revolve Bible Church. So this is not the only baptism we're going to have in the next couple months. We're going to have a couple more baptisms. Um, as we hear and see God's gracious gift of regeneration to people through the, uh, that's professed through the act of baptism. Well, this morning we're continuing our sequential exposition through the epistle of 2 Peter. We spent the first couple weeks in our study in just the first two verses. This morning, I'm going to do something that's not customary for me. We're going to go through verses 3 through 11. I know, amazing, right? And the reason we're going to do this is because in this section, I don't want us to miss the forest for the trees. In covering verses 3 through 11, there's going to be a half, uh, there's going to be for the, or because of the limits of time, a lot that we're going to have to omit this morning. Now we may come back in the coming weeks and zoom in on a couple of uh, the truths that are contained in this passage. But what I'd like to do this morning is, is help you to capture the meaning or the, the big idea of what's being communicated in these verses. Would you please follow along as I read our passage for this morning? Second Peter chapter one, beginning in verse three, and I'll read through verse 11. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now for this very reason also, Applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence and in your moral excellence, knowledge and in your knowledge, self-control and in your self-control, perseverance and in your perseverance, godliness and in your godliness, brotherly kindness and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Would you please join me in a word of prayer? Our Father and our God, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word, we ask that you would illumine our minds and ignite our affections so that we might love and serve you more. Lord, cause us to see that godliness is inseparable from true salvation. Lord, we pray that you would grant repentance to our friends that do not know you. And we pray for us believers that we would leave this room with a disposition that is diligent to be godly. Lord, help me to rightly divide your word. Strengthen me and uphold me, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to begin with some preliminary observations of this passage just to orient ourselves a little bit because we've been out of the book of 2 Peter for a little while. The, theme, or the title of my message this morning is Growing in Godliness. Growing in Godliness. Godly living is an important theme in 2 Peter. Peter was expecting to be martyred soon. Notice chapter 1, verse 14. Knowing that laying aside of my earthly dwelling is eminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, and I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, 
you will be able to call these things to mind. Peter is about to, to use his language, lay aside his earthly dwelling. It's imminent. The Lord Jesus Christ has made it clear to him. Peter's expecting to die. And as he's thinking about going and being with the Lord, he's also thinking about what do I need to leave behind for the church? And what jumps into his mind for these churches that are in now what is modern day Turkey, he wants to deal with the issue of false teachers. This is what is on the mind of the apostle Peter on the eve of his martyrdom. In 1 Peter, he deals with enemies from without. He deals with persecution from the world and how we as Christians are to respond to that. Then in 2 Peter, he deals with enemies from within. False teachers that arise from within the church, instructing God's people to live ungodly lives. The false teachers that Peter is addressing in the short epistle were denying the second coming of Christ and the judgment to follow. That denial or the denial of that doctrine led these false teachers to embrace an immoral lifestyle under the banner of following God. Look, if Jesus isn't returning and there's no judgment, it really doesn't matter how I live. But he is returning. And when he returns, judgment is coming with him. And so Peter in chapter 2 exposes false teachers by calling them ungodly. Look at verse two, verse, chapter 2, verse 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. And then notice verse 2, many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. Often it is difficult to spot false teachers in the church because they mix their false teaching with truth. One of the main ways we identify false teachers is through their sensuality, their immoral lifestyle. Peter goes on to call them ungodly. Notice verse five. And did not spare the ancient world, this is God, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Verse 6, and if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly. Peter uses the words ungodly, godliness, and godly repeatedly through this epistle. And the reason for that is because he's exposing the ungodly lifestyle of false teachers, which helps us recognize who they are. But he is also showing us that true salvation always includes godly living. Let me repeat that. True salvation always includes godly living. When God saves us, he sets us apart to himself. When he declares us not guilty, when he forgives us of our sin, he also separates us from our sin. We don't separate, the Bible does not separate justification and sanctification. They go together like a package deal. If you have justification, you have sanctification. And if you have sanctification, you have justification. And so Peter begins his epistle by highlighting godliness, that true believers live godly lives. Now, I'll say a couple technical things in the message this morning because this is a, some of the things that are said here in these verses are difficult to interpret. But I'd like to point out that verse three begins with a conjunction. Now, in Greek, new paragraphs don't usually start with conjunctions. So because of this, some commentators see verses three and four as attached to verses one and two. I believe though, contextually, it makes most sense to attach verses three and four to what follows in verses five through 11. Now the reason I say that, because if this is the case, that means that the main idea of verses 3 through 11 is that Christians are to live godly lives. 
Notice in verse 3, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Now the word life comes from the Greek noun zoe. Now the reason why this is important is because the Greek language has two main words for the word life. Zoe and bios. Bios is where we get our English word biology from. And when the Greek word bios is used and translated into the English as life, it references the material aspects of life. Often when the Greek word zoe is employed as and translated into English as the word life, it refers to spiritual life. Now, also notice in verse 3, that phrase, life and godliness. Secondly, notice the word godliness. Now, the Greek noun for godliness literally means good worship. One lexicon defines it as awesome respect accorded to God, devoutness, or piety. Godliness is everyday behavior that reflects the character and nature of God. Of God. To be godly is to live in such a way that reflects the character of God. The opposite of godliness is worldliness. To live in such a way that reflects the character of this fallen world that's ruled by the prince of the power of the air, Satan. Ungodliness, according to Jerry Bridges, is living as if God does not exist. Godliness is seeing all of life through the lens of I'm accountable to God, I'm dependent on God, and I'm doing everything to the glory of God. End quote. But thirdly, in verse 3, I'd also like you to note the word and in the phrase life and godliness. The word and is the Greek conjunction chi, and it makes life and godliness grammatically inseparable from one another. Thomas Schreiner writes in his commentary, godliness is linked to life because the latter is not gained without the former. Eternal life is not merely the experience of bliss, but it also involves transformation so that believers are morally perfected and made like God. True spiritual life and godliness are inseparable. False teachers claim to have spiritual life, but they are, but they live lives rather that is devoid of godliness. Listen, if you think you're a spiritual person, but you don't live a godly life, you're not. You're still spiritually dead. Peter is making this thrust apparent, or this truth apparent, in his mini-sermon, so to speak. Now, now that I've made some preliminary remarks about the passage and introduced us a little bit to the topic of godliness, let's dive into the passage together. I have four points for you this morning, and we're going to use those points um, to divide up this passage into four sections. Let me give those to you at the outset. For you note takers, you can write these down. First, I want you to notice the divine enablement. The divine enablement. Secondly, we'll note the diligent effort. We see the divine enablement in verses 2 and 3. Then we see the diligent effort in verses 5 through 7. Then in verse 3, we see the direct explanation, or I'm sorry, point number 3, the direct explanation in verses 8 and 9. And then fourthly, the demanding encouragement in verses 10 and 11. So let's begin with our first point, the divine enablement. The divine enablement. Notice in verses 3 and 4, in those two verses, the phrase, has granted appears twice. Notice in verse 3, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Then in verse 4, for by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent 
promises. Has granted is one word in Greek, and it means to present or to bestow. In both instances, the verb is in the perfect tense. When a Greek verb is in the perfect tense, it describes, listen to this, a completed action that occurred in the past with continuing effects in the present. The emphasis of a perfect tense verb is not so much on what happened in the past, but on the present effects that results from the past action. So again, notice the text with that in mind. God has granted, the English captures it, past tense. He has granted. This is something that happened in the past and it has impact on today. God has granted everything pertaining to life and godliness. And then verse four, God has granted past and has present effects his precious and magnificent promises. Now, let's take the two things that Jesus Christ has granted to Christians one at a time. First, he has granted everything pertaining to life and godliness. He has granted to us godliness. Notice verse three, seeing that his divine power that is Christ's divine power. Christ has granted to us, notice the word, everything. Everything pertaining to life and godliness. There is no such thing as a second blessing of the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian. When someone becomes a Christian, they have everything of godliness. They have everything of spiritual life. The moment that somebody becomes a Christian. Also notice in verse three, notice that godliness is granted to us through the true knowledge of him who called us by his glory and excellence. Godliness is the result of knowing Christ. This word knowledge here, gnosis in Greek, it is a reference to experiential knowledge. It's not just head knowledge, but it's experiential I know him. In fact, this word is used in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament that was dur around during the time of Christ to refer to intimate knowledge between a husband and a wife. It's not just information, it's experiential knowledge. When someone comes to know God through Christ, they are granted life and godliness. Listen, Unless you know Christ, you will not live a godly life. Godly living only comes from knowing Christ. And that's why we as Christians don't judge unbelievers in their ungodly lifestyle because we know that we did not become godly through our own effort. We know that our godliness, the ability to uh, be godly was granted to us through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now as we're stopping at this point, and thinking about godliness as something that's granted, we need to make a couple important applications. Number one, and I've said this in a way already, but I wanna say it in another way. Hear me, godliness does not give us a relationship with God, but a relationship with God results in godliness. Oftentimes, people will come to me as a pastor and they'll say, Pastor Ryan, I want to know God. I'm trying to live a righteous or godly life. You see, that mindset reveals that you think that godliness equals you knowing God. But the Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. In fact, turn with me to Romans chapter three, a familiar passage to us at Revolve Bible Church, and it is no trouble for me to remind you again of what Paul says in this passage. When the rich young ruler went to Christ at night, he went to Jesus and he said, good teacher, and Jesus responded to him and said, there is none good but God, why do you call me good? You see, oftentimes in our lives, we think that people are inherently good. But the Bible tells us that people are not inherently good, people are inherently bad. 
When Adam and Eve sinned, they plunged the whole world into sin with them. We call that in Protestant theology, the doctrine of original sin. God does not give perfect babies to imperfect parents. The reason you're a sinner is because your parents were a sinner and their parents were sinners. Nobody is perfect. We are conceived in iniquity and we're born into this world spiritually dead. We're born into this world sinful. But the question becomes, how sinful are we? The answer to that is totally sinful, completely sinful. And Paul makes this explicitly clear in Romans chapter three. Notice talking about the whole world beginning in verse 10, as it is written, he's weaving together a series of passages from the old Testament. There is none righteous, not even one apart from Christ. Who's righteous? None. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. Wait a minute, pastor Ryan. How is that true. There's people that come into church all the time that say they're seeking God. Listen, they're actually not. They're not seeking God himself. They're just seeking God's stuff. They don't want God because they love him and cherish him. They just want what God can do for them. But when God awakens a soul and when someone gets converted, they want God. As John Piper says, God is the gospel. True Christians love God, and that's why we're here. Now, we enjoy all of his benefits, but that's not the thrust of why we serve him. We serve him because we love him because he first loves us. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Verse 13, their throat is an open grave and with their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asp is under their lips. Those whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths and the paths of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Paul then in verses 19 and 20 tells us that the purpose of the law, the 10 commandments is to show us that we are sinners. Notice verse 20, because of the works, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, but through the law comes the knowledge of sin. We're not saved through trying to be godly because apart from Christ, our works, our effort to be righteous, our effort to be godly is as a filthy rag useless, completely and totally useless to God because we are totally depraved. God's solution? Well, he gives us it beginning in verse 21. Now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, meaning the Old Testament talks about this, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift, not by works, by his grace through the redemption which is in Jesus Christ, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. God sent forth his son, to take upon himself the wrath that you and I deserve because of our sin. Go back to first or second Peter with me. Now in the text, what's important to see is that godliness does not result in salvation, but salvation results in godliness. Are you here today and you want to know God? It's by faith and by faith alone, not by works, so that any man, so that man shall not boast. If you want to know God, it's not by trying to be a good little boy or a good little girl, but it's by placing your faith in Jesus Christ. And what exactly are you trusting in Christ for? You're trusting that he was your substitute. You're trusting that when he went to the cross, he took upon himself the wrath that you deserve for being ungodly. You're trusting that he has paid your price. And that he's lived the perfect life. And that perfect life, according to Romans, is imputed to your account. So when the father looks at you, he sees you as not guilty. And he sees you in his son. He sees you as he sees his son. Because you're in Christ. Godliness is granted. But the second application is not just that godliness does not give us a relationship with God. But that a relationship with God results in godliness. Second, application is that Christians have no excuse to not be godly. Often we deceive ourselves into thinking that we can't change. 
To say that you can't change is to say that God has not granted to you everything that pertains to life and godliness. One of the biggest lies of the enemies to the church is that you are a victim. You can't control your emotions. You can't control your thinking. You can't control your feelings. You can't control your anxiety. You can't control your, impression, your depression. Listen, that is all a lie from the pit of hell. Why is that a lie? Because if you are in Christ, he has granted to you everything pertaining to life and godliness. Everything. You can change, brother. You can change, sister. Now that change is not often easy as we will see in this text. But it is possible. If you're a Christian and you walked into this room this morning with sexual sin in your life, with pornography addiction, with alcohol addiction, with being slanderous or abusive to your family because you have an anger problem or derelict in your duty as a parent or a spouse. I have hope for you. You can change because he has granted to you everything pertaining to life and godliness. And we must be patient with one another as we progress in godliness. But notice secondly, the second thing that is granted to us in this text, not just everything pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who's called us by his own glory and excellence, but secondly, for by these things he has granted to us his very precious and magnificent promises. Again, granted is in the perfect tense, a past action with present results. Peter is not saying God has promised to do things for you in the future. It's a little confusing. Notice the text in verse four, for by these things he has granted to you his precious and magnificent promises. It's not saying God has granted you a promise and he promises to accomplish something in the future. That's not the idea. The idea is that he's already granted you all of the promises that come with salvation. The promises in mind here are salvation promises. John MacArthur in his commentary notes that these promises include spiritual life, resurrection, the Holy Spirit, abundant grace, joy, strength, guidance, help, instruction, wisdom, heaven, and eternal rewards. That's not an exhaustive list, but the idea here is that God has granted you the salvation that the Old Testament promised. That's the idea. And this salvation that has been granted is precious. That word precious comes from the Greek adjective timios, and it refers to something of exceptional value. The word magnificent comes from the adjective megas, and it simply means great, and in this instance, it refers to something that is relatively superior in importance or something that is extraordinary. Can I ask you, is your salvation the most important and the most extraordinary thing in your life? Is the fact that God has granted to you his salvation promises the most important thing in your life? In just a moment, Peter's going to say, if it's not, that's why you're not growing in godliness. And then just as a passing comment, but this deserves a fuller treatment. Notice in verse four, he goes on to say, so that by them, that is the prom salvation promises, you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Do you see that phrase, partakers of the divine nature? This is a phrase that's been abused. Multiple volumes have been written on it. Uh, Christians get caught up with what that means. Let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that you become God. It doesn't mean that you become a little God. What it does mean is that you partake in his divine nature, meaning or referencing godliness. As he is morally excellent, when you 
come to Christ, God grants you godliness, life and godliness. To be our partaker in the divine nature is a reference to the earlier statement. Now this was a phrase that was common in the, Hel- in, um, in, uh, the Hellenistic period. Helen is the Greek word for Greek. That's what Greek is in Greek. It's Helen. Hellenistic refers to Greek culture. In the first century, Peter's writing to a largely Greek audience, or they're living in the Greek empire, which was here in modern day Turkey. And this was a phrase that was common in their vernacular. When he says, uh, partaker of the divine nature, Peter borrows that phrase from Hellenism uh, to kind of communicate with them on their level but he's not using it Hellenistically. He is infusing it with the meaning of being like God, meaning living a godly life. Now we do not become like God in all respects. We're not omniscient. That means uh, we're not all, all knowing. We're not uh, omnipresent. We're not everywhere at once. So we do not uh, partake of the divine nature in every aspect, um, but there are attributes that we share in common with God. And that's what Peter's referencing here. Now, let's move from the divine enablement. Now that we've seen that godliness is rooted in Christ's power, Peter now moves to exhort the recipients of this letter to apply all diligence to living a godly life and what he has done for us. So point number one, which we just covered, the divine enablement. Listen, we got to start there. I know it was a little technical. We did some work, but listen, church, listen, you can live a godly life because it's already been granted to you. Oftentimes I'm asked as a pastor, why do you tell people to live a godly life? And my answer is simple because if they're a Christian, they can because it has been granted to us. And this is precisely Peter's point. Point number two, the diligent effort. We noticed the divine enablement, now the diligent effort. We see this in verses five through seven. Notice verse five. Now, for this very reason, for what reason? Because Christ has granted to you everything pertaining to life and godliness, because Christ has granted to you his uh, precious and magnificent promises, for this reason, notice the text, applying all diligence. Applying all diligence. The word diligence comes from the Greek noun spude, It refers to the earnestness and concern with which an action is carried out. Listen to me. If you, Christian, are going to be godly, and you must be godly as this passage goes on to show us, if you are going to be godly, you have to put effort into it. You have to walk You have to run the race. Godliness does not come by putting your Bible under your pillow at night and sleeping on it. You will not become godly if you own a Bible. You must apply what scripture teaches and you can. Because everything pertaining to life and godliness has been granted to you. Now, I want to digress for a moment and give you a little footnote, an important footnote. There is a theology that pervades the American church. It's called Keswick theology, spelled K-E-S-W-I-C-K. Looks like Keswick, but it's pronounced Keswick theology. Keswick theology is named from a place that it originated from in Northwest England. Keswick is a small town in Northwest England. Now let me tell you what Keswick theology is. My guess is you've probably not heard the phrase Keswick theology, but you may have accidentally held to it at some point in your Christian life. 
Now, Keswick theology assumes that Christians experience two blessings. And what they mean by that is f- the first blessing is you get saved. God saves you. But when he saves you, there's no transformation. Therefore, you need an additional blessing, a second blessing, a sanctified blessing, if you would. Now, that's the presupposition of Keswick theology. Now, to get to the second blessing, Keswick theology teaches that you need to surrender and have faith. And the common mantra for Keswick theology is let go and let God, Jesus, take the wheel. That's unbiblical. Why? Because when you need to change, the Bible doesn't say, let go and let God. The Bible says, be diligent. Forget what lies behind and press forward to the things that lie ahead. Philippians 3, 12 through 13 says, not that I have already attained or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that which is also lay hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. Who's doing the reaching? The apostle Paul. Paul wants to progress in his walk with Christ. How does he do that? Not by letting go, but by reaching forward. Listen, are you stuck in your walk with Christ? Are you stuck in a particular sin? The pathway forward is not surrender. The pathway forward is effort. Notice the text, verse five. Now for this very reason, applying all diligence. Remember this word diligent, it means great effort, earnestness, zeal, concern, Ah, I just want to get over this. Are you praying? Are you reading your Bible with great effort? Are you furthering your understanding of theology? Are you committed to the fellowship of the saints and asking people to pray for you and help counsel you and give you wisdom to get you to the next level? Don't just sit there and think that you're going to become more godly by doing nothing. It's a lie. That's what Satan wants you to believe because he wants you to feel stuck. There's great hope in this passage. But in order to get unstuck, you need to use diligent effort. Now, notice the text. Because God has granted to us everything we need for life and godliness, we diligently pursue it. And he tells us what to diligently pursue. Now notice verse five, in your faith, so he assumes faith. Faith is assumed. He's assuming that the recipients of this letter already have faith. And he said that earlier, look at verse one. He says, Simon Peter, a bondservant of the apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have received a faith. We tackled that, faith is received. It's not drummed up within ourselves. So he now assumes that the people he's writing to have received a faith. And now he gives a list of seven virtues that are to be added or supplied to faith. Now he does this with a a Greek literary form. I don't want to get into too many details with this literary form. Sometimes people get tripped up in this passage because they think of it because the literary form does kind of function as a staircase. And they just look at the text real quick. They think of it like this. Okay, now that you have faith, add to your faith moral excellence. And now that you have moral excellence, add to your moral excellence knowledge. So they see it as kind of a stepping stone. Okay, I have faith, so now I'm going to add this, and then I'm going to add this, and then I'm going to add this. In this particular Greek literary form, it's not so much important to see it as a rising staircase, but as a chain that links the th- different things together. The order is not so much what's important as in understanding that these virtues are inseparable from one another. Does that make sense? So as we go through this, what are you and I to be diligent in? Notice 
you are to add to your faith moral excellence. That's kind of an umbrella term that just refer, refers to morality in general. Okay, I just want to stop here. I just, I, somebody give me a soapbox. I want to stand on it. Are Christians supposed to be moral? And even unbelievers know that. That's why they call Christians hypocrites when they see us living immoral lives. But we are so sinful, we're fighting against that truth. Even though he has granted to us everything for life and godliness. Listen, you need to supply to your faith moral excellence. Not just morality. You need to be excellent morally. Things that are immoral should not even be named among us. We are to be the most moral people in the entire world. Not because we're better, because we're different. Because he has placed his spirit in us and he's transforming us from the inside. And that renewal on the inside works its way to the outside in the way that we conduct and live our lives. You need to add to your faith, you need to supply moral excellence and in your moral excellence, knowledge. Now again, notice this same word here. This here is probably not a use to experiential knowledge, but information. Listen, you can't worship somebody you don't know. You need to get to know God. You need to understand theology. You need to understand truth. You need to understand the word of God. According to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I say this a lot. Listen, if you would have known me in high school, you would never have thought me a guy that goes to school. In fact, God saved me between my junior and senior year of high school. I wasn't going to graduate. I didn't have the grades and I had way too many detentions. I worked really hard my senior year and by the grace of God, I graduated. You see, something began to happen when God saved me. I became a student. I hated school my whole life. And then all of a sudden God saved me and I began to want to learn. Who is he? What is this wisdom he speaks of? What happens to the believer is they become readers because God has chosen to communicate his word in a book. And so we grow in our knowledge and understanding of who he is. Add to your moral excellence knowledge and to your knowledge, notice this, self-control. Each one of us is to know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and in honor. Can I ask you, how much effort are you putting into controlling yourself? Is that a priority in your life? And to your self-control, perseverance. We keep going. Why? Because we forget the things that lie behind. We forget the sins of our past because they've been removed as far as the east is from the west. We forget the successes of our past Because the successes in our past don't have anything to do with where we're going. We press on toward the goal. We persevere. And then to your perseverance, godliness. Again, character that is reflective of who God is. And to your godliness, brotherly kindness. That comes from the Greek word Philadelphia, which is where our English city comes from. It means the city of brotherly love. We are to love one another. And in your brotherly kindness, love. This is the word agape. So phileo is the Greek word that often describes familial love. So that's where Philadelphia comes from. It describes a family love, brotherly love. But here the word love is the Greek word agape or uh, agapao and it refers to an act of the will. It's important to understand here that we are to put effort into denying self and willingly sacrificing to love others. How are you doing with your diligent effort? That leads us to our third point, the direct explanation. Why is this important? Okay, I get it. It's important because he's granted to me everything for life and godliness, and I'm to put diligent effort into being godly. But now Paul or Peter tells us why this is so important. Notice verse eight and nine. The direct explanation. For if these qualities are yours and increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
What's interesting about verse eight is it tells us that there can be such a thing as a useless and unfruitful Christian. Do you know why you're useless and unfruitful to the Lord? Because you're ungodly. It's really that simple. You see, often when we think about being used by God, we tend to just think about spiritual gifts. I don't have that person's gift. I can't do what they're doing. I can't serve like they're serving. You see, but everything that we are has been given to us. There is nothing that we are that God has not given to us. The gifts that we have were sovereignly chosen by Christ and he gave those gifts as he ascended. You see, but although we cannot control the gifts that we've received spiritually, what we can do is we can be diligent in pursuing godliness. And our godliness is directly linked to our usefulness. Do you understand that? Are you being used by God? Is there spiritual fruit coming out of your life? Listen, I'm telling you, there's one reason it's not if it's not. It's because you're living in an ungodly way. Notice where Peter goes next. By the way, on this point, point number three, the direct explanation, he gives a positive explanation and a negative. The positive is, if these qualities are yours, and then notice the word increasing. You see that? How much godliness should be in my life? There's never enough. Because I will not be perfect until glory, so until the moment I enter into eternity, these things need to be what? I need to be more loving today than I was yesterday. I need to be more morally excellent today than I was yesterday. I'm going to forget the things that lie behind and I'm going to press on. If these things are yours and they're increasing, they will render you neither useless nor unfruitful. But why am I not focused on being godly? If godliness is the key to my fruitfulness, why am I not focused on being godly? Well, Peter tells us in verse nine. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. It's interesting in the Greek where the word blind and short-sighted is used together it's probably saying here that this person is blind and the reason they're blind is because they're short-sighted or nearsighted, myopic. I'm nearsighted. For those of you in the back of the room, your faces are all blurry to me. Some people see me wearing glasses and they're like, you wear glasses? I say, yeah. And they say, why don't you wear them on Sundays? It's like, so I don't have to see people's reactions and I can just keep going. <laughs> That's a joke, kind of. <laughs> nearsighted means... I. Uh, I, I can't see things at a distance. I see things closely. I'm short-sighted. I, I can't get all the way out there. You see, what Peter's saying here is Christians who, who forgot that God has removed all of their sin. Now, the interesting part here is this could be a reference to baptism when it says in verse nine, for the purification of his former sins, because that phrase is used in Acts in conjunction with baptism. In the early church, nobody was saved without being baptized. Today it's different. People resist being baptized. In the early church, it wasn't that way. The idea here is that people that are not growing in godliness, the reason they're not growing in godliness, the reason they're not putting diligent effort in is real simple. They're not focused on Christ. They're Salvation is not precious. It's not mega. It's not magnificent. They've forgotten how wonderful the precious promise that they've received is. And at some point along the way, Jesus stopped being as lovely as he was when we first believed. At some point along the way, he ceased to be that treasure hidden in the field that we went and sold all that we had so that we could buy that field and have that treasure. 
At some point along the way, he ceased to be the pearl of great price. That's why you're not diligent in godliness. It's the only reason why. So the pathway forward is simple. Thank him for your salvation. Rekindle afresh your love for him in light of his love for you. And you will increase in godliness. Do you see it? It's like the gospel is like rocket fuel to godliness. Now let's put all this back in the context of the passage. Why is Peter talking about this here? Because false teachers don't love Christ. Because if they did love Christ, they would be godly. Do you see the point he's making? So he's saying to them, listen, you have received faith. The faith. Be diligent in godliness because you're focused on the gospel and your life is going to look totally different than these false teachers that are rising among you encouraging licentiousness and ungodliness. And that brings us to point number four. The demanding encouragement. Now you'd think at this point Peter would be like done, right? But he's so worked up about this that he, he just has to say to them again, you need to be double diligent. You not only need to be diligent about being godly, you need to be double diligent. Look at verse 10 and 11. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent. So he says in verse five, apply all diligence. Now he says, be all the more diligent. Hey, I want to circle back around and I want to hit that again. And the reason I want to camp there and talk about that is because something very, very important is at stake. Well, what's at stake, Peter? Why are you exhorting me again to live a godly life? Look at verse 10. Be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. Listen, I have people all the time, they learn about the doctrine of election. Let let me back up real quick. The doctrine of election is that God chooses you for salvation. And let me just make it real simple. Here's why that has to be the case. Because you're so sinful, you would never choose God on your own. Anybody that gets saved is saved because God first worked in them. It's simple. If you understand uh, the depravity of man, election is the only answer to be saved. But here's the thing. Christians say this all the time. How do I know that I'm elect? Well, notice what Peter says. Be all the more diligent to make certain about his what? Now, word calling and what? choosing. That's the Greek word where we get our word election from. Make certain about his choosing you. How do you make certain that he's chosen you? How do you know that you know that you know that you are numbered among the chosen? Godliness. That's how you know. The word certain means to validate. Our election is validated by the way that we live. Now, Calvin thought this was a reference to subjective assurance, meaning you could be certain about his choosing of you subjectively, meaning in your heart through godliness. But I think it's more than subjective. I think it's objective. And the reason for that is because all through the New Testament, we're told that those whom God has saved, God has sanctified. False teachers, false converts are people that love the idea of forgiveness, but they hate the idea of sanctification. It's real simple to see false teachers. False teachers will come to you and they'll say, I believe in Jesus. 
I love Jesus. He's so loving. He's so great. He's so kind. He's so forgiving. He's so merciful. But they resist the idea of people telling them you need to change your life. See it? Let's go through a couple of verses that just unpack this and make this explicitly clear. Some we've been to, some we've not. We're going to do this real quick and we're going to close here. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. Immediately following the service, we're going to have a baptism just out front. And by the way, for the first time in the history of Revolve Bible Church, we have a heated baptismal. <laughs> so uh, Rosa, you're the first one to get the heated baptismal. Rosa's going to reference this verse when she shares with us her testimony. God has done a great work in Rosa's life, and I can't wait for you to hear it from her own words. But in Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, cast out demons, and in your name, perform many miracles. Notice what the assurance of their salvation was resting on. Their church participation. Lord, I, I cast out demons in your name. I prophesied. I spoke the word of God. I taught a Bible study. I mean, I taught children's ministry. I even cast out demons in your name. Verse 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice what? How should, can you be assured? Not by your participation in serving him. That matters. But our assurance comes from not practicing lawlessness. Turn to John 15. If you're already in Matthew, just a couple books over. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John chapter 15. In John chapter 15, verse 14 You are my friends if you do what I, what? What's the, what's the opposite of a friend? An enemy. How do you know that Jesus is not your enemy? Because you do what he, what? And you can just work through the gospels and see all of the things he commands you to do and they include living holy and righteously. Turn to Romans chapter 16. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts, and John. After the book of Acts, you get to Roman. I'm sorry, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. All right. Pray for your pastor. I need it. I really do need it, so please do pray for us. But Romans chapter 16, notice verse 25. As Paul closes this epistle, now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Christ Jesus, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret from long ages past, but now is manifested by the scriptures and the prophets according to the commandment of the eternal God has been made known to all the nations leading to obedience of what? Faith. Faith. The gospel leads to obedience. Obedience. Turn to 1 Peter. If you had your finger in 2 Peter, where it's just right there, go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, we looked at this not that long ago. Notice again verse 2. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to what? obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. Back up actually. Look at the last part of verse one. Who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of the father. What's the point of your chosenness? Of his choosing of you? Look, to obey Jesus Christ. Go to verse 22 of chapter one. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren. Last one, turn to 1 John. 1 John. Keep going toward the end of your Bible. After 2 Peter, you get to 1 John. 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 1 John. Notice chapter 2, verse 3. 
1 John chapter 2, verse 3. By this, we know that we have come to know him. How do you know that you know him? It says it right there. If we keep his commandments. And then here it is. The false convert, the false teacher. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments, couldn't be stronger language here, is a what? And the truth is not in him. How much more helpful we would be to people in the church (laughs) that proclaim to know Christ, but refuse to conform to godliness if we would just say, you're a liar. And I'm not the one saying that to you. That's what scripture says about those that say they're saved but do not keep his commandments. Do we keep his commandments perfectly? No, No, we do not. There is no such thing as a perfect Christian. There's a doctrine out there, the Nazarene church, the church of the Nazarene holds to this. They call it perfect sanctification. They believe in this life you can actually become perfect. Paul says in Romans 7 that that's impossible. He says, I keep doing the things that I don't want to do and I don't do the things that I want to do. What are the things that he wants to do? He wants to be righteous, but he keeps on sinning. And so he ends that passage by thanks be to God who will set me free from this body of sin and death. Thanks be to God, Christ Jesus, our Lord. He's looking forward to the day when he will be in glory. When he's in glory is the day that this body of sin, so to speak, is removed. He'll get a new body transformed right? That's a doctrine of glorification. That's for a whole nother sermon. But the point is this, as Christians, we are diligent. We are doggedly diligent. We are dogmatically doggedly diligent. Say that three times fast about growing in godliness. Don't go to a church that's not And you'll be fruitful. And you will not be useless because you will keep Christ at the center and he will use you to accomplish his purpose in this world. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this poignant reminder. Strikes at the core of the gospel. Thank you for showing us that godliness is a part of who we are now but it's only because you have granted it to us. Lord, not to us be the glory, but to you. Lord, we are wretched sinners apart from you. But because you have saved us and placed us in your son and granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, and because you have granted to us your precious and magnificent promises, we have escaped the lust of the world. Lord, may we be all the more diligent. We want to be a fruitful church. We want to see you save more people. We pray that you would use us to do just that and to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. We thank you for our time together in the word this morning. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.